you would turn to Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. There are folks here tonight that God has brought specifically here to hear this. We have visitors. We're glad to have our visitors. It's good to see brother and sister Phil Ewing with us tonight. God bless you folks. Sure surprised to see you, but very pleasant surprise. We love these folks very much, and we're glad they're here tonight. I'm glad to have all of you in service tonight, and uh, several of you for your first time. Sister Brenda Hammer's sister-in-law, right, is here tonight. She and I met in uh, uh, Toys R Us, right? We sure did. I didn't know her. She didn't know me, and I thought... Her and her daughter were somebody else. And uh, I said hello, and they didn't know me. They gave me that look, and that look told me, I don't know who you are. And I said, I know you. And they said, no, I don't know you. I said, oh, I'm sorry. If somebody goes to the church I pastor, or that it's attended church I pastor, looks just like you. And uh, they said, what church do you pastor? I said, oh, I'm pastor of Antioch. And they said, Antioch. Sister Hammer had told him about Antioch. So we're glad to have you with us tonight. <laughs> Amen. And we're glad to have all of our visitors. And forgive me if I've mentioned a couple of names and not mentioned you. We're happy to have you. We really are. Okay? Let's give our visitors a hand. We're happy to have you. Amen. Praise God. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 7, if you would permit me, please, for a few moments here tonight. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Brother Dave, you're going to hear this again. Where are you at? Brother Dave, Breckenridge, you're going to hear this one again. Is all right to hear it twice? Okay. I'm going to preach this a second time to him, first time to you. No, second time to some of you too. Okay. Praise the Lord. I want to talk about uh, getting to know the Lord personally. How to deepen your personal relationship with God. And how God works in our lives to deepen our relationship with Him and make it more intimate. You may be seated in Jesus' name. God bless you. <clears throat> now, I intend to go slow unless I get fast, but my intention is to go slow. Is that all right? I'll talk to you a little bit. Uh, when people first come to God, He deals with people in two basic ways. Some people He deals with God. God deals with them in... Uh, uh, in a combination of these two, and some most, mostly one way and some mostly the other. One of the ways that God deals with people is strictly through truth, the Word, doctrine. He takes them to the book, and He shows them what the book says, and they see that what, uh, what the Bible says, and that's what they need to believe, and so they uh, become what the Bible says. They, they, they accept the scriptural teaching as their doctrine, they accept the scriptural uh, way of living as their way of living. And uh, God deals with them primarily through the Word and through the knowledge of God in a factual sense. All right? And there's some of you sitting here. I can look over this congregation. And that the way, the primary the way the Lord dealt with you was He began to deal with you about the Word and about your need to go someplace to church that preached the Word as close as possible. But then there are other people that, that aren't really, they don't know the Word or they don't really care about the Word or they don't really understand the Word or maybe they don't accept the Word of God in their lives and God deals with them by giving them opportunities to know Him personally. 
uh, the word isn't going to affect them. You can preach the word to them all you want. But by letting, but by them being in certain situations, having certain problems, and in those situations, finding out that God really does care, that He really is interested in people's lives, it is by those means that God makes Himself known to them as a God of love, a God of kindness, a God of goodness, mercy, and so on and so forth. And it's those things that affect them and cause them to come to God. For instance, say a person gets into drugs and, and their life is messed up. You can go preach to them doctrine all day long and you're not going to affect that person. But if somehow you can bring that person into one-on-one -on -one contact with the Spirit of the living God and they can experience God for themselves, then the, that presence of God and that love of God and goodness of God they feel from that kind of a contact with God affects them and causes them to want to live for God. And then you take that person after they've got a relationship with God and they've met God personally and, and, and they found out how good he is, they begin, then you teach that person about, about God, about his word and so on and so forth. The other person that uh, comes to God out of the, the fact that they studied Scripture and they see what the apostles teach and that's what the apostles teach and, and I want to do what the, what the Lord taught the apostles to do and so on and so forth and they, you know, they see the need to be baptized and be baptized the, the Lord's way. I mean, they're, they're, they're good people. They're living for God. No major crisis in their lives. They're just searching for more of God and for more of the Word of God, so on and so forth. That kind of a person comes to God through the Word primarily, and then God puts them in situations to help them learn to know Him personally. comes right back to the Word and Spirit situation again. Spirit and truth. comes back to that again. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how God deepens our relationship. If you'd permit me to read a little bit in the Amplified, uh, I'm going to read the whole passage, and then I'll come back to some points here that are important. Verse 7 in the Amplified says, But whatever former things I had that might have been gains to me, I have come to consider as one combined loss for Christ's sake. Now, this world can't understand that. A lot of people seek out places to go to church that uh, makes them feel a little better. But they're afraid to go someplace that's going to challenge them to live by this book. And when you begin to talk about commitment and you begin to talk about dedication and you begin to talk about uh, following the Lord and taking up your cross and denying yourself. Boy, you talk about a barrier and pulling back on that, there's a problem. When you talk about uh, loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, whoa, whoa, I didn't bargain for that far. I had no intention of going that far. See, I, that's, that's farther than I intended to go. The only reason people feel that way is this. They don't understand what he says in the next verse. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of, of the priceless privilege. Now, he explains that. The overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Let me tell you something, friend. This world doesn't really understand what it knows, what it means to know Jesus Christ. You preach to people about dedication, about commitment. Most people are willing to give one hour on a Sunday, and that's Christianity. But you talk about going to church two or three hours on Sunday, then coming back that night for a couple of more hours, and going somewhere in the middle of the week for a couple of hours, and going to church in the middle of the week for a couple of hours. They say, aren't you going overboard with this? What you don't understand is this. There is something so priceless and precious and Un unsurmountable and, and uncomparable about Jesus Christ and knowing Jesus Christ that uh, when you really begin to see the value of this and really begin to experience the preciousness of this uh, nothing else is important anymore 
We don't quit our jobs and leave our families and become spiritual hermits or uh, monks in a monastery. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that everything else finally fa falls into some place on the priority list in its proper perspective. And the only proper perspective for things in this life, including family, job, possessions, pleasures, and all of it, is someplace under the first one and the first priority of life. Life is Jesus Christ. Everything else is second to Him. And notice I said Jesus Christ. Church is part of that. But church, you can go to church and not know Jesus. So I'm not preaching going to church as first priority. I'm preaching knowing Jesus as first priority. But if you know Jesus, you want to go where the body's gathering and fellowship with Him. It's not a question of do I have to. It's when can I? When is the next service? You mean it's that long? I have to wait all the way to Thursday night? You mean we can't have church again till Sunday morning? Hey, you want to get together and pray tomorrow night? I, I don't want to miss something. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's something priceless in this. There's something in this you can't put a value on. If you've come to this church for a little while and you're struggling with all of this, the only reason you're struggling with all of this is that you really haven't had a glimpse of what it means to know Him. He says, yes, furthermore, I count everything as lost compared to the possession of the priceless privilege. The overwhelming preciousness the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him friend let me tell you what this is what this is all about we're not in some stagnant pool of religion This is not some deep freeze, spiritual deep freeze we're in where we're hoping to have our spirits frozen so that later on in some miraculous hereafter that God will suddenly, suddenly somehow be able to have the cure for what ails us. You know, they're doing that to people's bodies nowadays. They're quick freezing them and storing them away somewhere, hoping to revive them when the cure for their ailment is found. That's not what this is. We're not here on some survival trip. Yeah, I want to go to heaven, but I intend to enjoy the trip. Yeah, I want to go to heaven, but I really intend to enjoy the ride. I didn't say it's easy. Sometimes it's got bumps in the way. But overall, hey, there's nothing better. There's nothing better than knowing Him and living your life knowing Him. You can't compare it to anything. It has no comparison. He said of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him. Of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. People, I know people who go to church don't even understand that. That's never crossed their minds. It hasn't dawned on them that they can know the Lord personally. And for those of you that are new around here, let me say up front. We are not here preaching Antioch. And we're not here preaching United Pentecostal Church. And we're not here preaching religion. We don't even believe in religion. We believe in Jesus Christ. That if, if you could come here tonight and, and we could tell you what quote unquote we believe. And you say, I believe all of that. that doesn't, that's not our point. That we're not trying to, to win arguments and get people on our side. We're here attempting to help people to establish and grow in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. To know Him. To know Him. I got married 17 years ago this November. I didn't get married by mail either. It wasn't by telegram. We didn't do it by video hookup across the country. 
we didn't communicate with one another and fellowship with one another over the telephone uh, for these last 17 years. Excuse me, but we've lived together. You don't ever get to know somebody like you do when you live with them. And that's why a lot of people don't know Jesus. They meet him at the church and leave him there when they leave. Don't you understand what we're talking about? When you become a part of the church, you have been made a part of the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ. The Lord said of Eve concerning Adam, now she's now flesh of your flesh and bone of your bones. She is now one with you. You're going to live with this lady. That's the way you're going to get to know her. You're going to know everything about her. You're going to understand all about her. It's going to be a progressive thing, a growing thing, a personal thing, an intimate thing. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it's fully intended for you to take the Lord home with you that night. That's the full intention of all of this. It's to say, come on, Jesus, go home with me. Welcome to our house. You know, that's what a groom is supposed to do is provide some place for the, for the bride to live. Carry her across the threshold, Right? Well, in this particular case, it's supposed to be the other way around. The bride's supposed to carry the groom across the threshold say, Welcome to our house. This is where we're going to live. <clears throat> we're going to live together, Lord. We're going to get to know each other. That's what I'm talking about. That's what this is all about. This isn't religion. It's not worth anything if it's religion. It's not any better than anything else if it's religion you can make a religion out of sports it's no better than that without personal relationship you can make a religion out of rock music drugs you can make a religion out of all of that anything you you, you seek for peace through is your religion anything that you seek for your greatest fulfillment and pleasure from that's your religion your religion may be work if that's where you get your greatest satisfaction in life, and that's where you derive your greatest source of joy and pleasure from, that's your religion. That's right. And this is no better than that. If, if all we're talking about is just learning the tenets of somebody else's doctrine, Doctrinal faith. That's all it is. Hey, I believe in doctrine. Doctrine, simply, the Greek word for doctrine simply means teachings. And when I talk about the doctrine of Christ, I'm talking about the teachings of Christ. Anybody says they don't believe in doctrine, don't believe in Jesus. Because He's the Word made flesh. And doctrine is nothing more than the teachings of the Word. Period. Anybody tells me that doctrine divides is saying Jesus divides. And He does. He didn't come to bring peace. He came with a sword. But I don't stay away from doctrine and I don't stay away from teaching the word because it divides the wheat from the chaff. But we're not just here to wield a sword. And we're not just here to teach some, the tenets of some faith. But we're here to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're here wanting to know Him. Amen. For His sake, I have lost everything. Did you hear that? For this precious one, for this precious privilege of knowing Him, of having a deeper and more intimate relationship with Him, to, for the privilege of knowing Him personally, I've lost everything, Paul said. Now, if you're feeling like some martyr or some hero or like the president of local pity party because it's cost you something to be a Christian, uh, you're not going to find any pity from Paul. In fact, this is what he said about all of his loss. He said, for his sake I lost 
everything and considered all to be mere rubbish. And the Amplified expands that with refuse. Garbage. King James says dung. You know what that means? That means he wasn't pining over what he'd lost. He wasn't feeling like some great martyr who had sacrificed so much. He's saying, hey, compared to this, this is nothing. Whoa! Let me have this. He wasn't going back to the place where he lost all of that and weeping tears over it and saying, oh, I gave up so much. I, it, I resent it when people tell me what they gave up to come to church. Gave up? You didn't give anything up. You got delivered of some things. What you've gotten in return is so much greater than anything it cost you. Paul says it's just garbage. It's just refuse. You haven't given anything up. You're no martyr. Amen. Let me ask you ladies something. If on your wedding night, you and your husband have gone, your new husband have gone somewhere and, and he makes his little speech, darling, I want you to know how many I have rejected to marry you. Why this beauty queen and this starlet and this model and and this, and you, I turned all of them down for you, and you should feel so privileged that I have chosen you. You know what I'd do if I was you? I'd say, listen, jerk, there's the door. If that's the way you feel about it, you need to go to all those people. Obviously, they weren't so hot, or you wouldn't have rejected them. Don't give me your sad story about all you've given up for me. And then people come to church and, you mean if I live for God, I can't do this anymore. I can't go there anymore and I can't use all those precious little four-letter words anymore. And I can't, I can't smoke myself into oblivion. You mean I can't destroy my lungs anymore? And I, I can't. I, I, you, you mean, you mean I've got to give all of that up for Jesus? You got to be kidding me! You got to be joking. No way. But I'm going to tell you what, if that's in your heart, friend, it'll eventually come out. You'll tell it to somebody. If that's your attitude, the first time things don't go just right, we'll go begging the Lord. Oh, after all I've done for you, Lord, you let me go through this? <clears throat> you know what that's called? D.C. Dead center. That's not bullseye. Somebody just got hit. On the mark. That's exactly right. That's why people get so down when things don't go well. It is nothing more than the product of an attitude that says. Look all I've given up for you and why haven't you taken care of me? Hey friend, let me tell you something. If the Lord never answered another prayer of mine. If I never ever again felt his presence in time of worship. If he never spoke to me again. If I was isolated from my brothers and sisters as many of my brothers and sisters have been done over this last century. In parts of this world. And never again was able to say praise the Lord to somebody. If they took my Bible away and I was never able again to read the Word of God. Still, 
He's done so much for me. I have no reason to complain. I have nothing to complain about. I have nothing to be down about. I have nothing to feel bad about. That's why he said, in the world you'll have tribulation. He warned us in advance, hey, you're going to have some problems. But he said, be of, of what? Of what? You're kidding, Lord. You mean this for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, sickness and health stuff is real? You mean that wasn't just pretty little words we said in our spiritual marriage here? That I really am supposed to have as good an attitude when it's worse as I am as I do when it's better? Hallelujah. You mean I really am supposed to be able to praise you as much when I'm sick as I do when I just got healed? Do you mean I really am supposed to be able to praise you just as much when my wallet's empty? As I would when somebody just gave me a fat check? Let me tell you something, friend. The only reason it would be different than that is that we feel like we've done God a favor. I'm talking to somebody. We feel like we have done God such a favor. Well, God, you know, the, the Lord to, talked about a little story. There was a publican that came to the temple and found a corner somewhere and got down on his face and smote his, his chest, which was an oriental sign of uh, sorrow. Orientals do that. Sign of great sorrow. But God have mercy on me, a sinner. And about the Pharisee who stood boldly. <clears throat> Father, I am thankful for you. That you are so privileged to have one like me. For I have, uh, I pay my tithes. I pray. I even fast. And you're so fortunate that I'm one of yours. I'm talking about knowing him. I'm talking about being real. Let me tell you something, friend. You can't come into the presence of God without being real. You've got to be real. It's so foolish to come and put on. He knows everything going in, on inside of you. Of course, I know some folks will say, well... I can't worship because I, I've made a mistake, so I'm just going to sit here and pout. That's not what he's talking about either. That's not what he's meaning either. Because the person I'm talking about here that knows the Lord says, Lord, <clears throat> here I am. I've blown it again. Forgive me. I know you love me. I know you don't love me. I know you don't love me one bit less because of my mistake. And I ask you to forgive me and I accept your forgiveness. Amen. Skipping down to verse 10. For my determined purpose is that I may know him. Is that your purpose? Amplified says, for my determined purpose purpose is that I may know him and then it explains what it means by know him that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly that I may know him that I may know him The, Amplify, the Living New Testament, let me read just a little bit here and then I want to come to that last part. 
of verse 10. But all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so, I, so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have put aside all else, counting it worth less than nothing, in order that I can have Christ. Verse 10, now I, now I have given up everything else. I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ. He's come to him. He said, here I am. Let me tell you in what frame of reference he's talking about this. Again, some of you have been around here a while. You know, I'm sorry. It's the best example I've got. But do you honestly think a woman in the right mind would marry a man and accept a, an open relationship? That's a, that's a very non-threatening, unassuming term for adultery, condoning adultery. Do you think that a woman in a right mind or a man in a right mind would accept a relationship, a married relationship, where that goes on freely? That it's part of the deal? No. I mean, I don't think my wife is unreasonable. But when we got married, she expect, expected me to sever my relationship with all of my old friends. <laughs> you understand what I mean? And some can't understand that she really would feel strange if I had pictures of me and someone else sitting up on my dresser. It's just a picture, isn't it? All of you ladies that would be broad minded enough to accept that from your husband, let me see. One. That's right. That's right. Hey, it's only normal to accept that when you come to the altar to be married, that you're going to forsake all others and keep yourself for him or her only so long as you both shall live. We understand that. Is it really all that difficult to comprehend that the Lord expects His bride to do the same? The big complaint the Lord had was with Israel was she was all the time chasing other lovers. Of course, he was talking in a spiritual sense. But adultery is, natural adultery is nothing more than a, spirit, than a natural illustration of spiritual relationships that God is against. Isn't it amazing that some of us who would be so against natural adultery so easily and readily accept spiritual adultery? When what God expects us to give up is so unreasonable. But what we expect our husbands or wives to give up to be married to us is it's reasonable. I've said this many times, but, you know, tell me the sin if I went to any lady, any lady in this church, said, let's go to McDonald's and get a hamburger. I, I need to talk to you about some things. And we went to McDonald's and I bought us both hamburgers and Cokes and sat down Right there in the restaurant across from each other and talked. That was it. Now you tell me what in the world, where the sin is. But I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> that little lady sitting over there, I promise you, I'd choke on that hamburger if she saw me. I promise you. Can I be honest with you? I'd be disappointed if she felt any different than that. I would be disappointed. Hey, you know, somebody comes along and flirts with you a little bit. <clears throat> I'm not excusing jealousy that is totally unreasonable. 
But there is a jealousy that is reasonable because the Bible says that God says of himself that he is a jealous God. That's in the book, you know. Jealousy, there is a degree of jealousy that is godlike, that is scriptural. There is a degree and type of jealousy that is an expression of love that says, didn't I give myself to you? Didn't you say you gave yourself to me? Didn't you commit to me that we would reserve ourselves for each other only so long as we both shall live? But you say, I haven't done anything wrong. I've just sat there and ate a hamburger with a lady. But don't you understand that you've given other people the occasion to question our commitment to each other? No wonder it says, don't give place to the devil. And don't let your good be evil spoken of. No wonder it says that. Do you know why? Because if I'm sitting at McDonald's with some lady and one of you drive by and see me sitting there, you know what your first thought's going to be? I wonder if Sister Wright knows she's there. I wonder if Sister Wright knows about this. That's, hey, it's so fast. That's such a normal reaction. It's so quick. It'd be in your head before you even thought about it. And I watch some of you play around with God and flirt after other lovers. And my first thought is, I wonder if the Lord knows about that attitude. I wonder if the Lord, I wonder how the Lord feels about that attitude. I wonder. And there are some people that say, oh, you're making a big deal out of nothing. I wouldn't want to be married to that person if this is nothing to them. If this is nothing to them. I'm not the perfect husband and I'm not preaching me to be the perfect example. But I'm going to tell you something. I conduct myself around other ladies in such a way that my action and attitude communicates my respect for this one. Excuse me, brother. I got a couple of you in trouble just then, didn't I? Sorry about that. <clears throat> That's right. I do. The way I act toward other ladies is not as much a discredit to me as it is a discredit to her. It's saying she doesn't have very good judgment. Her taste isn't very good. It also says <clears throat> that she's a fool because she trusted him. How many times you know? have you ever known someone that their husband or wife was cheating and, and you knew about it and you, and you thought, oh, I feel so sorry for her. I feel so f sorry for him because if she only knew what he's doing. If he only knew what she was doing. I want to talk to you a little bit about how to grow in this relationship with the Lord. Amplified says, the last half of verse 10, And that I may in that same way come to know the power of outflowing from His resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share His sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into His, kindness, his likeness, even to His death. Living New Testament says, I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. I'm going to say this to you again. I said it a couple of weeks ago, but this church hasn't really grasped it yet. And that is, the only reason God would allow you and I to go through difficult times is so that first of all we might understand him and fellowship with him and his sufferings. 
And second of all, when all else has failed and there's no other way, he comes along and solves the situation, corrects the problem, answers the need. And then we know him in his power to resurrect. Every story in this book that we believe is a, book, a real big deal, every one of them, is ultimately the principle of death followed by resurrection. Every one of them. Every one of them. The children of Israel come out of Egypt. They're trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. How did they feel like? How did they feel? They felt like all's lost, didn't it? And in the midst of that suffering and that isolation and that hopelessness, the Lord parts the Red Sea. Then how did they feel? Resurrection. I'm here to tell you something. If you live for God very long, you're going to meet so many impossible situations in your life that it will blow your mind. God, The Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, yet shall he rise. You will meet impossible situation after impossible situation. I'm going to tell you something. If you're not careful, you'll feel like David did. David said, I looked at the wicked. I looked at the wicked. And it looked like everything was going okay for them. It looked like all of their problems were solved and everything was easy. And here I was. It looked like I'd cleansed my hands in vain. It looked like it. What, what's the big deal here? I am suffering. But he didn't understand. He just didn't understand. And if you're not careful, you're going to see that situation and you're not going to understand either. Coming to the Lord and living for Him does not guarantee you a life of ease. It does guarantee you a bed of roses. I promise you, you come for, to live with the Lord, it's going to be a bed of roses. Hallelujah. The flowers are beautiful, the fragrance is wonderful, and the thorns are sharp. Yeah. Promise you. But you've got to understand something, friend. I'm not for arguing and fussing and fighting if you're married. Sister Wright didn't teach tonight, is that correct? So I'm, I'm teaching on marriage tonight. Okay. I don't, I don't think it's good. I'm not saying it's wonderful, but I tell you what I like about fussing and fighting. The making up. And many times, things that we would have not communicated under normal circumstances. You know, emotions rise, we blow off a little steam, things settle down, we begin to talk. And finally, she tells me things, I don't know how she thought I was supposed to know that. I couldn't have known it any other way. But you know what the problem was? She didn't think I'd listen. But now she knows she's got my ear. So she tells me. And I say, I didn't know you felt like that. Well, that may, You mean it makes a difference? Yeah, it makes a difference. Some of the best communication we had was after problems. And I'm not preaching in favor of problems. But if that's true in a natural marriage... What do you think about a spiritual marriage? Don't you realize we're flesh? What is it in a natural marriage that brings people to those places? Pride? Stubbornness? Drawing back from your mate? Hello? One not loving the wife as he does his own self, or the wife not reverence and submitting to her husband, you know, huh? And so eventually that thing builds up and... And you say, oh, terrible. Oh, no. God knows we're just like that. As long as everything runs along smooth, we'll sit back and put that thing in cruise control. And half the time we'll be praising the Lord. And the other half the time we're going to be living by our own dictates of the dictates of our own heart. We're going to be living in our own stubbornness and our own rebellion. But you let crisis come. And we're going to get out on our knees somewhere. And we're going to talk to the Lord about things we would have never talked to Him about any other way. And when it's all over with, hey, the relationship's much better. 
friend, I'm going to tell you what. When you've been going through it and you don't know which way to turn, and you get so desperate there's nothing else to do. And you find yourself, yourself a place to pray. And you didn't get down there for an hour. You got down for the duration. And you get down there and you pray until something happens. And you pour it all out to God. And you just unload and unburden all of that stuff off of you. And finally, it breaks through and you begin to worship God and love God. And you get up from that prayer meeting, you feel like 10 million tons lighter. It's a new day. The sun seems to be shining a little brighter. The stars are just a little crisper. The, the moon just looks a little more beautiful. You know what I mean? The, the birds seem to be singing a little, uh, a little prettier. And the, the trees are just greener and the sky is bluer. And everything's just better. It's true. You see... You can sit down with this book and you can learn a lot about God. But if you really want to know Him, there's some things you'll never know about God except through fellowshipping with His suffering. Amen. He took Joseph in his dreams to the dungeon. It was all dead, friend. It was gone. It was over with. And in the midst of that suffering, he revealed himself to Joseph, and then resurrection came. And the one who had been the victim of bitterness and jealousy and hate and vengeance, who'd been sold by his own brothers into slavery, was able to greet them with tears streaming down his face and saying, Brothers, don't feel hard at yourself. You didn't do this to me. It was the Lord. He sent me here before you to save the family. That's the product of knowing the Lord in the fellowship of His sufferings and the power of His resurrection. He gave a promise to Abraham. 25 years it took for Abraham and Sarah to have that baby boy. 25 years. He waited till Abraham was dead reproductively, and so was Sarah. He was 100, and she was 90. And here comes the bouncing baby boy. Finally, rejoicing in the, in the Abraham household. Baby's born. Right? Great event. Sometime later, and I'm not sure how old the baby was, sometime between the age of 12 and 30, the Lord said to Abraham, and he just, just, <clears throat> you know, he pinpointed it unbelievably. He said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom ye love. Take that boy of yours, the only one you got. You know that one that's the only one you got? You know that one you love? Take him up to Moriah, sacrifice him. You're kidding. You gotta be joking. I mean, you said I was going to be the father of many nations. You changed my name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. This is my only child that you're recognizing. This is it. And you want me to take him to Moriah, kill him? Abraham went. Took the boy up to the top of Mount Moriah. Fixed up the altar. Laid him on the altar, on the wood, on the altar. Took the knife in his hand. He's going to take his life, burn him right there. Don't ask me about all of that. I know the Word of God says not to offer burnt sacrifice of your children to God. It's abomination. He didn't do it. He was just asked to. The Lord didn't let him do it. But he wanted to see if he was willing. Took that knife in his hand. Had it drawn back. Every muscle in his body was tense to come down. And the angel of the Lord stopped him and says, Now I know. Now I know that you will obey me. Now I know. You see, in these times, God not only lets us learn to know Him better, but God also learns to know us better. There was death on that altar. He knew Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. He also knew Him in the power of His resurrection. How about this? 
a dungeon somewhere in Israel. Something, excuse me, not Israel, somewhere in the Middle East. I don't, I don't remember where exactly. Philippi, that's where it was. In Philippi. It's a dungeon. It's the middle of the night. There's two preachers there. Their backs have been beaten to a bloody pulp. They're in stocks and bonds. They're sitting around griping about how rough they've got it. They're sitting around accusing God. Look what all we've done for him. And look where he's let us land up. <clears throat> Talking to you. Look where, look where he's let us land. After all we've done for him. That's what they were doing, weren't they? No, they weren't. Backs beaten to a bloody pup. Feet and arm or hands and stocks and bonds. You know what they were doing? They were singing something along the line of, Oh, hallelujah. Midnight now. In the dungeon. Backs beaten. Oh, hallelujah. What's wrong with you guys? You're weird. Oh, hallelujah to the king of kings. Isn't there any bitterness? For he is worthy. You guys need a psychiatrist? Of all our praises. Oh, hallelujah. Suffering. Knew they, they were fellowshipping with him in the fellowship of his sufferings. They were learning to know him. But he never leaves you there. Do you understand that? Whether it's 25 years for Abraham or 13 years for Joseph. Or whether it's overnight in a lion's den for Daniel. Or whether it's a few minutes in a fiery furnace with the three Hebrew children. It doesn't matter how hot it is, how bad it is, where it is. He won't leave you there. Only long enough for you to get to know him better. And if you'll just be patient, and you'll just keep the right attitude, and you'll just keep the right spirit, you're also going to get to witness the fellowship of the power of his resurrection. Midnight, they're worshiping God. Here comes an earthquake. All the doors pop open. Stocks and bonds come loose. The jailer sees all of that happen. He's ready to run himself through the sword. They said, oh, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. He came, down, came in and fell down at their feet and said, what must I do to be saved? Resurrection, friend. Let me tell you something. Nobody gets a miracle that doesn't need a miracle. Blind eyes are not open for somebody that has normal eyes. Deaf ears are not unstopped for those who can hear with perfect hearing. Lame legs are not made to walk if you can run the mile in four minutes. You don't get a miracle if you don't need a miracle. But let me tell you something. If you're fellowshipping hit with him in your sufferings, you can rest assured if you need a miracle, you will get a miracle. Hallelujah. No. No, I can't promise you it's going to be in the middle of your course on old hallelujah. I can't promise that. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't promise you it's going to be this moment. I can't promise you there's going to be a fourth man walking visibly in your fiery furnace. But he will be there. I can't promise you that you'll see the angel stopping the mouths of your lions in your lion's den. But there will be angels there. I can't promise you that. But I'm going to promise you this. You can know him in the fellowship of his sufferings and in the power of his resurrection. You can know Him. And I'm going to tell you something. You will never get to know Him any other time, any other way like you will then. For those who have such 
little comprehension of them, of him. For those who are so geared to the fairy story ending of life, and they lived happily ever after. What would you do? Well, I became a Christian. And you know what that means? You're going to live happily ever after. Jesus Christ, my prince on the white stallion, has come to rescue me from all of my problems. I'll never, I will never again know difficulty. For I now have someone to solve all of my problems before there ever a difficulty. If that's what you think it's all about, you can forget it. The only place those endings take place are on TV. If you believe that junk, that's your fault. But I'm here to tell you something. Life is real. There's sorrow in life. Did you know that? It really is. If you haven't encountered any yet, you will. There's difficulties in life. There's disappointments in life. There's discouragements in life. There's stresses and strains and all of that. Paul said, I've learned both to abound and be abased. I've learned what it means to have plenty, but I've also learned what it means to have my pockets full of nothing but holes. I've learned, I've learned, I've learned. It was, it was after that passage of Scripture where he said he had learned both the, how to abound and be abased. It was after that passage of Scripture that he said, I can do all things through Jesus Christ which strengthens me. He was, that verse isn't related to some kind of Superman uh, uh, faith where you can go leap over tall buildings in a single bounce. It is through the Lord that I can learn how to be faithful and love Him and thank Him. When I'm abounding and when I'm being abased, I can learn. I have learned, Paul said. I have learned. You know something? You don't have to learn something you already know. Are you listening to me? Have you already dismissed or what? I said, you don't have to learn something you already know. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am there and to be content. I have learned how to abound. I have learned how to abase, be abased. I've learned it. I've learned it. How did you learn it, Paul? In the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings. Let me tell you something. If comfort, ease, fairy story endings on life, personal comfort, pleasure, prestige and all of that is important to you here and now then when God says to you come into this situation where you'll draw close to me instead of seeing it as the Lord saying I love you I want to get to know you better you'll see it in this light why me? why me? why have I got to go through this? what have I done to deserve this? That's the way you'll see it. Why do I have to get married? Why do I have to marry this person? I prayed. The Lord said it was His, his will. Why do I have to get stuck with this one? Why did I have to have a kid turn out like this? Why couldn't I have one that's calm? Hallelujah. I preach to everybody from up here. <laughs> Why me? Why? Why do I have to suffer all of this? This doesn't fit into my schedule. This doesn't fit into my plan. Look at me, please. Not the organ. She's taking it very well. Thank you. Hallelujah. Why me? Well, let me tell you something. I'll tell you why you. Because he thought he could trust you. Oh, 
Uh, one more time. I'll tell you why you. Because he thought he could trust you. He thought when you said, I love you, Jesus, that you meant it. He thought that you meant it when you said, I want to be closer to you, Lord. He thought you really meant it when you said, Lord, I want to know you better. He thought you meant it. And so he did what was necessary to answer your prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, I realize there's a part of Christianity today that's all faith, blessings, prosperity, and miracles. I believe in blessing, prosperity, and miracles, but I believe in this too. I believe in this too. I wouldn't want to be Joseph on the throne of Egypt without a dungeon experience to make sure I'd be saved while I was up there. God knows. The Lord knows. Is He precious to you? Is fellowship with Him precious to you? Is the knowledge of Him precious to you? Does it mean anything to you to have the privilege to get to know Him intimately? Paul said in one place, and this is the crux of the whole thing, I don't remember it exactly. I, I can't remember the place. I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I believe. But he said something along the line of this way. He said something about being known of God. He said, yea. He said to know God, but yea, rather to be known of God. Talked about knowing the Lord and say, but yea, rather to be known of God. Praise God. Do you know why the first year or two or three of a marriage, four or five, it's so necessary for it to be rough? Because if it was all daisies and tulips and lollipops and perfume and bubble baths and candlelight dip meals, you'd never get to know each other. You'd never get to know each other. I mean, it's like dating. You can't judge her by dating. You can't judge him by dating. You had not smelled his morning breath yet. Excuse me. Not trying to be crude, but you know what I'm talking about. Oh, man, you got that expensive cologne on, the tie tied just right, and the, the belly tucked in just so. I mean, there's a couple of guys around here that lost weight to get married. You can't judge him by what happens beforehand. The only thing that counts is after the I do. That's it. The only thing that counts is after the I do. Everything else is immaterial. When you said, I do to the Lord, did you mean it? Did you mean it? Is it really for better or for worse with you? Is it really for richer or for poor? Is it really in sickness and health? Is it really till death do you part praise God would you stand God bless you the Lord loves us and he wants us to love him 
But it is impossible for you to love someone you don't really know. It's impossible. It's impossible. If you want to love him, you've got to get to know him. Praise God. I'm not going to give you an altar call tonight. I just want to leave that with you. Is that all right? I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask before anybody is moves or is dismissed or whatever that the leadership would go upstairs immediately. I've only got about a half hour and that's all I'm going to take, but I need you up there now. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you. We appreciate you. We honor and praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you've done for us, God. You've been so good to us. And, Lord, we still haven't fully grasped this. This still hasn't clicked. And to some degree, it's, it's so distasteful to our flesh. There's part of us, God, that this is really not appealing to. But somehow, some way, God, give us just a little glimpse of what it means to really know you. To really get to understand you. To have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with you. And give us the desire, Lord, to know you. To really know you. To have a strong, close, personal contact with you, Jesus. We need you tonight, God. We need you more than we have any idea that we need you. I want you to move in our lives. Touch us, God. Help us to do your will in Jesus' name. Praise God.